What's up, everybody? This is your jack of all trades, and this is part two of how to retire with enough money by Teresa Ghilarducci, chapters four, five, and six. Chapter four, saving, spending, and debt, or how to keep your head above water in the richest nation in the world. America is a funny place. For one thing, ask the average person on the street and they'll likely tell you the United States is the richest nation on the planet. Actually, as measured by the commonly used yardstick of gross national product per person, the United States tends to hover around 6th to 7th richest from year to year. Norway, Singapore, and Switzerland are all richer than we are. Why do so many Americans have this misconception about the United States? In part, it's because of the sheer size and spending power of our middle class. Compared with nations in which wealth is concentrated in the hands of the few in America, middle class families often vacation abroad and even working class families own homes and cars. This isn't the state of affairs in most of the world. To the rest of the planet, America looks like one big wonderland of prosperity. So why do so many of us feel poor? Why do we lie awake worrying about money? One reason is Americans' famous tendency to consume. From the moment we wake up in the morning until we go to bed at night, we're part of a huge machine designed to separate us from our money. Asking people to save money in America is like asking them to give up chocolate. Spending and its partner, credit, is deeply ingrained in American life. You deserve it. We're constantly told by advertisements and the media. Plus, you get what you pay for and it's an investment. If your money is slipping out of your hands and you can't figure out where it all went, well, you probably had some help spending it as quickly as you did. But it's actually possible to visit Hershey, Pennsylvania and not eat chocolate. And it's possible to live in America and not overspend. I've listened to quite a few people talk about how they intend to bridge the gap between the money they have and what they'll need for retirement. Sometimes the ideas are good ones. Sometimes, frankly, they're not. Here are some ideas I'd rather you ruled out. Bad idea number one. I can always live with my kids. Yes, the romantics say that the multi-generational family is going to have to be recreated to solve the retirement crunch. Admittedly, there's charm to this idea, but financially, it's not a magic bullet. Why? Because in America, the greatest predictor of a person's wealth is the economic status of his or her parents. According to a 2020 Pew Charitable Trust report, more than 40% of people who grew up in the bottom 20% of the income scale were still in their adulthood. The rest didn't make it too much higher on the ladder. Fewer than a third had ascended to middle class status or better. Working class and lower middle class parents usually raise working class and lower middle class kids. The result? The more likely you are to need to live with your adult children the less likely they are to have the space or resources to help you out. This is the same catch-22 we saw with working past age 65. It's a strategy most available to the people who need it the least. Also, it's rarely the best solution in terms of everyone's mental health. Adult kids often don't want to live with their parents and older people value their independence. Bad idea number two. I'll move to a state with lower taxes. Sure, it's a plan. 
but it's a screwy plan. Yes, film directors shoot movies in states that offer tax advantages, but you're not going to be there for a 12-week shooting schedule. This is your life. Are you going to want to leave friends, family, traditions, a favorite restaurant, and the familiar view from your front window, all for a marginal difference in tax rates? Even big businesses factor in these kinds of personal preferences when deciding where to make their headquarters. One study found that an influential factor in where businesses are headquartered is whether the CEO wants to live there. The tax advantage is a secondary consideration. Bad idea number three. I'll read investment newsletters and magazines. Seems counterintuitive, right? How can increasing your financial know-how be a bad thing? Yet statistics tell us it is. Study after study shows that people confident in their investment skills tend to trade frequently. They also trade on current news. The problem is that frequent trading increases your brokerage fees, cutting into your profits. And trading on the day's headlines is just as bad. Current news to the world at large is news that's been expected and taken into consideration by the pros who have already sold and moved on. But the self-taught investment magazine reading investor is preparing to buy high in hopes a stock will go higher and he or she is likely to sell low earning assets to pay for it. In short, they're buying high and selling low. You don't need to be an economist to understand why that's a bad idea. People who read about investment a lot are confident. In most areas of life, that's a good idea. It certainly is when you're walking into the boss's office to renegotiate a raise or approaching an attractive stranger at a cocktail party. But in the stock market, False confidence is your enemy. Now that we've covered some of the bad ideas, here are a few good ones. <clears throat> good idea number one. Downsize now. Live on 70% of your income. As I've discussed, very few people will have retirement income that equals what they were making during their working lives. 70% is approximately the highest rate most people can hope for. It's true that some expenses will go away after retirement. As I noted before, you won't have a commute anymore, for example, and you will no longer be setting aside savings. But new costs will arise. You will be going to the doctor more, and Medicare and health insurance won't pay 100% of your expenses. You might also if you have health or mobility problems, pay other people to cut your grass or clean your home. The upshot is that to avoid a jarring drop in your standard of living in old age, you'll need to learn to live well on that 70% now. It's easier and mentally healthier to make new choices and develop better habits while you're still in your 30s and forming spending norms with your partner, children, and peers. Being forced into a Spartan way of life in your 60s or 70s is very depressing. Plus, there's an obvious corollary. When you trim your spending, it'll free up money to pay down debt and contribute to savings. Good idea number two. Have a nice home in a modest neighborhood. Humans have lived in clans and villages forever, so we've been influenced by each other forever, sometimes to our detriment. Although the media and popular culture encourage you to buy as expensive a home as you can afford, that may be bad for your finances in ways that go beyond the monthly mortgage. Living in a high-income neighborhood is likely to nudge you into a more lavish lifestyle 
in emulation of how the people around you are spending their money. Being around affluent people makes affluence seem normal. What's above average for the nation becomes average to you if you see it every time you step out the front door. Consider bucking the trend and living in a more affordable part of town. Not only will your mortgage or rent and household expenses be lower, but you'll have a pleasant sense of your own prosperity and perhaps a greater appreciation of what you have. Yet more good ideas. There's no single magic bullet. Saving is a combination of many small efforts. The following 10 propositions are based on sound economic research. Number one, keep a budget and record everything that you buy. The first step in getting control of your spending is just being aware of it. This simple act of focusing your attention on where your money is going tends to reduce spending by 15%. Don't carry on on on. Don't carry an ongoing balance on your credit card. Too many people use credit cards as quick cash for everyday purchases, and about 50% of them carry a balance from month to month, incurring interest charges. It's better to carry a debit card with the credit card function. It will carry a balance, but only for a month, at which point you have to pay it off. Your actual credit card should stay at home in a hard-to-reach place. It'll be there in case of a true emergency. Number three, watch less television. What? Isn't television low-cost entertainment? And isn't anything low-cost good for a frugal lifestyle? The point here is that TV has an insidious hidden cost. The cost of things you'll probably buy if you're a frequent viewer. The reason for this extra spending is twofold. First, TV watchers are exposed to commercials, which we like to think we're ignoring, but that are crafted by experts to linger in our minds and urge us to buy. Second, rich characters are overrepresented on television shows. And even the working class ones have great apartments, expensive haircuts, and stylish clothes. It skews our ideas of what's realistic and attainable. Watching less television is like turning down the volume on an endless appeal to spend. Number four, rethink life insurance. If you don't have kids, you almost certainly don't need it. But if you do have life insurance, make sure it's term not whole. Term life insurance is insurance pure and simple. You pay premiums and get a lump sum if the insured dies. Whole life insurance has an increasing value that the insured can cash out or borrow from. It's an insurance policy that also acts as an investment. Unfortunately, it's not a good investment because the product is inflexible and the fees are high. If you've ever tried that peanut butter and jelly that comes in the same jar and didn't care for it, well, this is pretty much the same thing. Insurance and investments work better when they're two separate things. Speaking of insurance, raise the deductible on every policy you have. That will reduce your monthly premiums. The deductible is the amount of money you have to pay on a loss before your insurance company steps in and pays the rest. If you agree to pay a higher share, you get a lower monthly premium. For example, if you raise your home insurance deductible from $500 to $1,000, you can save almost 25% on your premium. This works similarly for auto and health insurance. Bottom line, insurance is there so that a huge misfortune won't wipe you out financially. That's clearly worthwhile. But don't pay high premiums month after month to avoid any unexpected expense. Number six. Similarly, never buy a protection policy for an appliance 
Many are quite reliable and run for years without problems. If one does break, take it back to the store. It's almost certainly covered by a warranty you got for free, usually a year. Number seven, as soon as you've bought a car, start saving for the next one. Then, when the time comes, buy a car you can pay for with cash. Notice that I say a car, not a new car. According to the Department of Transportation, in 2007, there were 254.4 million passenger vehicles in the United States. This for a population of about 300 million people, not all, are, not all of whom drive. There's absolutely no reason to buy brand new with so many high quality used cars out there. Need a better reason? According to Bankrate.com, most new cars lose 20% of their value as soon as you drive them off the lot, and another 20% of off that in the first year. Likewise, don't waste money on the extras, including an extended warranty. Consumer Reports found that most owners spent more on extended warranty insurance than they would have on repairs. Cars today are manufactured with better steel, meaning rust proofing and undercoating aren't worth the cost. Number eight, eating out. Try a trick restaurant, owners say diners use during big economic recessions. People go out, but they often forego beverages and dessert. Eat out and trim the bill. Enjoy the bread, though. It's free and probably contains fewer calories than the drink and dessert you were going to buy, saving about 20% on your bill. Number nine, speaking of dinner, Eat your vegetables. Get a little exercise too. Doesn't sound like financial advice, you say. It is. Health problems can profoundly undermine your savings because insurance doesn't cover everything. Number 10. I've saved the best for last. Don't carry a mortgage any longer than you have to. A 7 or 15 year option rather than the high price. 30 years standard will certainly raise your monthly payment, but you'll save money in the long run, partly because of a lower interest rate, but largely because you've half the time the loan is racking up interest. This is a good option for people who use a mortgage and house as a kind of mandatory savings plan. If you put most of your discretionary income toward your mortgage, you are storing your wealth in something you also consume. In other words, while you're paying the bank, you're also accruing savings. So paying off the mortgage as early as possible is one of the best deals around. You instantly get a rate of return equal to the interest rate you pay to the bank. This topic is so significant, I'm going to talk about it at length. Paying off debt, even better than saving. A true story. A brilliant scientist who had just won a major prize, not the Nobel, but one that awarded him more than $300,000, asked me if he should invest in euro-weighted derivatives. In response, I asked him a simple question. Do you have a mortgage? Yes, he said. Pay it off instead, I told him. That's a sure thing. The derivatives are not. He was stunned. Let's think about this a minute. He was a man who understood the workings of the universe, but he didn't understand why it was better to get out of debt than to put his money into an esoteric investment with no guaranteed rate of return. In fact, an investment so iffy, he risked losing every cent. Let's explore some interest rate math. Let's say you have 15 years left on your mortgage with $100,000 outstanding. Your mortgage rate is a low 5% and as a median earner, your tax bracket is 30%.
That means that you can deduct 30% of the interest you pay if you itemize on your taxes. Now let's say that you have $100,000 on your hands. Where did it come from? Maybe you pushed Bill Gates out of the way of a speeding bus and in gratitude he took out his wallet and gave you $100,000 on the spot. Just go with it. I'm making a point. You consider paying off your mortgage, but then decide that you'll hang on to it, reasoning that you need the tax deduction that you get from your mortgage interest and that you'll find a better investment for your $100,000. But that reasoning is invalid. Here's why. Over the 15 years that it will take you to pay off your mortgage, you'll pay a little more than $42,000 in interest to the bank. Ick. But you justify it because of that 30% tax break. It's true that you will save about $12,700 on your tax bill over those 15 years, but that's out of $42,000 total, leaving about $29,000 in total interest paid. However, if you use your $100,000 to pay off your mortgage, you're immediately $29,000 ahead. That's a non-taxable 29% return on investment. But wait, it gets better. This is where I'll explain the if part of if you itemize. The truth is, this is the truth is, unless you're a high earner with other things to itemize on your 1040, you're usually better off taking the standard deduction. At the time of this book's writing, the standard deduction was $6,100 for single people and married filing separately, and higher for heads of household and marrieds filing jointly. For example, consider a single middle-income person who's in the first year of a 30-year $100,000 mortgage with a 5% interest rate. If he has only the mortgage interest to itemize, he'd be far better off taking the $6,100 standard deduction than taking the $5,000 deduction for mortgage interest. In other words, it is generally true that unless the amount you pay in interest on your mortgage in a year exceeds the standard deduction for that year, you're better off taking the standard deduction. And in that circumstance, you actually aren't saving anything on your taxes by paying mortgage interest. Remember, the tax code is influenced by households in the very top brackets. The tax, bra the tax breaks for home mortgages, IRAs, 401k plans, capital gains, and so on are worth a lot more to people in the top 2% of earners. But the standard deduction and earned income tax credit helps households from the upper middle class on down. Let's go back to you. With your hypothetical $100,000 outstanding on the mortgage and your hypothetical $100,000 from Bill Gates, assuming that you're not in the top 2% of earners, you're better off taking the standard deduction, rendering the mortgage interest tax break completely irrelevant. Therefore, over 15 years, you'd pay nearly $43,000 in interest on your mortgage, which means that if you use your $100,000 to pay off the mortgage now, you won't save only the $29,000 that a higher earning taxpayer would save after using the mortgage deduction. You'll save the entire $43,000. Over 15 years, this averages out to the equivalent of an investment with a 2.8 percent annual return risk-free those last two words are italicized for a reason it's the most important point here there's absolutely no chance that your investment will tank or even underperform there's no market fluctuation or adverse news events that can undercut it it's guaranteed 
and that's a great deal. The only argument for carrying a mortgage that makes sense to me, and only barely, is that it automates savings for people who wouldn't save otherwise. Having a mortgage requires people to put money into their home every month that they probably would have spent otherwise. So, in essence, some people pay the bank to keep them from spending. I admit I did it once. But it's an expensive service. You'll be better off if you pay off your mortgage and start investing the money you save going forward. Whether you pay off your mortgage in one lump sum or by paying extra overtime, you're helping yourself to an easier retirement. This is true for any kind of loan, not just a mortgage. The same logic holds for a car loan or for credit card debt. It doesn't make sense to set money aside in savings while you have month to month debt. This is especially true if you're putting those savings into a very low risk vehicle like a passbook savings account. Why earn 0.1% interest on your savings? Looks like a misprint, doesn't it? While paying 15 to 18% interest on your credit card or 2 to 6% on a car loan. Bottom line, there are two sides to the interest rate. Either you're earning interest or you're paying it. As often as possible, be on the earning side. Remember that number seven on my list of ways to save money was that you start saving for your next car as soon as you've bought one. To take this idea a little further, consider a car savings account. If you're making payments on your car as soon as it's paid off, immediately start putting the same amount into a savings account toward the next car. The goal is to never have a car loan again. Yes, it'll be painful to give up on the idea of taking that money and putting it toward other expenses. But since you've been making that payment for several years, it's impossible to argue that you can't afford to set it aside now. More important, it's an easy jump from the paying to the earning side of the interest equation. Now, let's say you followed the steps above. Congratulations, you're a clear-sighted, responsible saver. But you can't just stick the money in a coffee can or, just as bad, a bank savings or checking account. You need to invest it. But should you do that yourself? Do you need a financial advisor? And if so, how do you find the right one? This is a tricky area, and it's what I'm going to discuss next. Chapter 5, Investing and Allocation, or I Have This Guy. If Jane Austen were alive today, she'd probably say that it is a truth universally acknowledged that a man or woman in possession of a fortune must be in want of a financial manager. In fact, you don't even need a fortune. If you're remotely middle class in America, almost inevitably you'll get hooked up with an investment advisor, or as I like to say, a guy. Your guy doesn't have to be a guy. Some are women. The result, though, is the same. Jeff called. He wants me to sell some bonds and buy frou-frou stock. He suggested $10,000 worth, but I said only 5000 Or, my guy is pretty good. He always calls and he doesn't push me into investments. Sounds okay so far, right? But when I ask people how much the guy cost, they don't really know. When I ask if he has fiduciary loyalty, they don't know what that means. When I ask if the investments he puts them in do better than a standard benchmark like the S&P 500 index, again, they don't know. The guy rarely takes into account anyone's taxes or debt levels or other real issues about their lives. The guy lives on commissions. In fact, 
many guys are essentially in sales with the working knowledge of financial terms. Many couldn't pass a basic financial literacy test. A definition of terms here. Fiduciary loyalty essentially means an ethical obligation to you, the customer. Helene Olin, author of Pound Foolish, Exposing the Dark Side of the Personal Finance Industry, explains it this way. If you bought a pair of shoes from a store that had fiduciary loyalty, it would be the store's responsibility to make sure those shoes really fit you before you left. Similarly, a fiduciary money manager can be sued if he or she doesn't give you financial advice that's solely in your interest. The news about money managers isn't all bad. There are felony, there are fee-only certified financial planners who are independent and free of conflicts of interest. They don't sell investment products and they don't work on commission. Such a professional will charge you up front to create a financial plan, similar to the way a lawyer would charge to draw up a will. This service might cost you $1,000 or more, but you'll save money in the long run. One caveat here. Fee-only advisors tend to be pretty rare outside cities, so you may have difficulty finding one if you live in a smaller town. However, the good news is that you may not even need a manager. To understand why, you have to understand what passive management and active management are. A passively managed fund is one in which the manager takes a hands-off approach, usually by following a stock or bond index. One such stock index is the Russell 3000, which contains the stocks of approximately 98% of the investment of the investable U.S. market. Smaller but better known is the S&P 500, introduced by Standard & Poor's in 1957. It follows the 500 largest publicly traded companies. This index is widely used to measure the general level of stock prices. A fund that tracks the S&P 500 therefore will mirror the general performance of the stock market overall. You won't be protected from the usual fluctuations. It will go up and down, but over time the market has always gained ground. In contrast, an actively managed fund is one whose manager chooses stocks in an effort to outperform the market. Some managers do succeed at this for a time, but these statistics show that such hot streaks always end. Studies done on actively managed mutual funds have been clear on this point. Past performance is a very unreliable predictor of future returns. Professor Jeremy Siegel explains this in detail in his book, Stocks for the Long Run. Using mutual fund data provided by the Vanguard Group and Lipper Analytical Services, he found that all actively managed equity mutual funds returned an average of $10.49% per year for the period 1971 to 2006, whereas the S&P 500 rose an average of 11.53%. It's worth noting two things here. First, the funds benefited from a stellar run for small stocks between 1975 and 1983. Over the period of 1984 to 2006, after the run was finished, actively managed funds returned an average of only 10.8% yearly compared with the S&P's 500s 12.26%. Second, and more important, 
the actively managed fund figures don't reflect the impact of sales and redemption fees. And now we've arrived at a crucial point. It isn't whether your fund manager can beat the market and for how long. What really chips away at your savings when you invest in an actively managed fund is how much your manager charges. Passive management can be done very cheaply by virtue of its hands-off approach. Index funds tend to charge about 0.1% of the total investment in fees. They pass the savings on to you. Active management by nature costs more. These expenses likewise are passed along. Usually the cost is about 2%. To illustrate this, Let's revisit that $100,000 you got from Bill Gates in Chapter 4. This time, let's say you don't have a mortgage to pay off, so you're free to invest in a mutual fund. Now you have a choice, an index fund or one with a fund manager who chooses stocks in an attempt to beat the market. Once you pick a fund, you stay in it for, let's say, 10 years. During those 10 years, the S&P 500 rises by 5% a year, and both funds match that in performance. Naturally, the index fund does because it tracks the S&P. The other fund does it through skilled stock picking by its manager. So after 10 years, that $100,000 has grown into $163,000 through the power of compounding. Let's pause here and talk about compounding again because it's that important. Remember the runaway growth of your credit card balance in the example I provided earlier? The one in which you made only the minimum payment? Interest, compounding, and savings works the same way. But the key point is the same. You earn interest on your principal and interest on your returns, meaning the picture just gets better over time. The earlier you start and the longer you can keep your money invested, the more the miracle of compounding works for you. So in our example, if you invest $100,000 at 5% per year, in 10 years that money will have turned into $163,000. Except that won't be the balance on the statement you get in year 10, whether you invested in an actively managed or a passively managed account. It'll be less than $163,000. Why? Because of fees. If you go with an index fund, you'd end up with $161,000. That's because index funds charge one-tenth of one percent of the assets under management. So instead of earning five percent, you're getting 4.9 percent. Because of the math of compounding interest, a 0.1 percent drop in the rate of return leads to a two percent drop in total return. In your case, that means you paid about two thousand dollars over the ten years to be in the index fund. Maybe that doesn't thrill you, but remember, an index fund's 0.1% fee is about the best you can do, short of writing to every single publicly traded company and enclosing a check for individual stock certificates that are then mailed to your house and that you then store in a gigantic filing cabinet. Yikes. But what happens if you choose an actively managed fund? That's where the math of compounding interest comes home to roost in a big way. Actively managed accounts generally charge up to 2% in fees. We've seen that in an index fund, every 0.1% in fees results in a 2% reduction in total return over 10 years. So every 1% in fees leads to about a 20% drop, actually a bit more given that we're dealing with compounding and its snowball effect. With a 2% fee structure, 
you get about 46% less in total return from an actively managed account over 10 years. In our example, your $100,000 investment has grown in the actively managed fund to the same $163,000. But the fees charged by your manager over time have eaten up $29,000. So you're left with $134,000. None of the difference is caused by your fund's performance. It's all fees. So if, in 10 years' time, you want to fee shame yourself about your choice, there's no shortage of ways you can do it. One, I earn 46% less than I would have in an index fund. Two, I got a 3% return when I could have gotten a 4.9% return. Three, I earned $34,000 instead of $61,000. And four, I paid $29,000 in fees when I could have paid only $2,000 in fees. Clear enough? You should also remember one thing. The above example generously assumes that your fund manager matched the market's performance, getting a 5% return. But history tells us that, minus a few lucky streaks, managed funds almost invariably underperform the market. I'm reminding you of that because a mutual fund manager is going to tell you his fund's fees are worth it because his experts picks will outperform the market but the statistics tell a different story are there ever managers who beat the market several years in a row sure but research shows high flyers generally last a few years at most given this why would you choose an actively managed fund you shouldn't this is one of the biggest mistakes people make to be absolutely clear, if you're with a broker or any kind of advisor paid on commissions, you should sever that relationship as soon as possible. Honestly, you would be better off earning the Boy Scouts personal finance merit badge and then trusting what you learn from it than using a guy. Simply put, low fee index funds are all you need. Vanguard Funds is a one-stop shop in this area. I have no connection to or interest in Vanguard. They just offer an excellent product. You can buy differently or you can buy directly from their website. You might be asking, but what if I have a high net worth? My answer is the same. Multi-billion dollar funds like the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund are so big that if they make a move, the world moves with them. They make markets. They need to be buying illiquid assets and private equity, etc., etc. You don't. If you still feel that you want someone to guide you through the investing process, get a fee-only advisor and pay up front for a personal plan. If you're part of a couple, Make sure that your partner in life and in finances is comfortable with the advisor you choose. Both parties need to feel secure about a decision this big. 401k plans revisited. You know by now that I'm no fan of the 401k and IRA or do-it-yourself model of retirement planning. The 401k plan and the IRA, where most 401k savings end up, have been so lucrative for banks and brokers who have a great deal of influence in Washington, D.C., that they aren't going anywhere very soon. So if your employer offers a 401k plan instead of a pension, that's the most important tool you have for retirement planning, and you need to use it as well as possible. Employer 401k plans do offer two very useful advantages. First, many employers match funds. The average rate is about 50 cents on the dollar up to 6% of your pay. 
that 6% of the pay that you contribute, meaning that in total, the company matches 3% of your salary. If you earn 70000 a year, your 6% contribution equals 4200 At 50 cents to the dollar, your employer adds 2100 raising your total to $6,300. Second, you aren't taxed on the money you contribute to a 401k, including the employer match, nor are your earnings taxed as the money grows. You'll pay taxes later when you draw down your savings, but it builds up tax-free in the meantime. There's a pitfall in the 401k structure, though. Vesting. If you plan to change jobs after working for your company only a relatively short period of time, you might forfeit some or all of the employer match. <clears throat> Vesting is both nifty and sneaky. It allows employers not to pay matching funds to employees who quit within a relatively short time, which makes it an incentive for employees to stay in a job. To be, to be vested in a 401k means that you've become entitled fully or partially to the employer match and you can keep it upon leaving the company. To keep 100% of the employer match, you have to be fully vested. Some companies use cliff vesting, which vests employees all at once after a certain waiting period. Other companies use graded vesting, in which the percentage you're entitled to builds up a little at a time, say 20% after a short initial period, then an increment of 20% per year after that. Policies vary, so check with your HR representative about how your company does it. In any event, a company can't make you wait more than five years to get to full vesting. The point, provided you don't change jobs frequently, an employer match will increase your 401k contribution by 50%. That's a 50% guaranteed return on your investment, which is 7 to 10 times more than you're likely to get annually from an index fund. And let me say it again. It's guaranteed. It's a great deal. Then why, Teresa, you might ask, have you been saying 401k plans have been bad for the average person? I still believe this for several reasons, including that the lion's share of the tax breaks go to the top earners who don't need government to help to save for retirement. More relevant to what we're discussing here, though, is this. American workers have, in large numbers, failed to contribute consistently and adequately to these accounts. That has happened for a variety of reasons. Some people put off saving for retirement in favor of saving toward more immediate goals, such as a young couple planning a home purchase. Other people simply lack financial literacy. Unfortunately, these also tend to be people who aren't earning high wages in the first place. They're very likely to say, I need all of my take home. I'll think about retirement when I'm 50. Even educated people and careful savers can be unclear on the benefits of 401k plans and thus fail to benefit from them. To see in more detail how this might happen, let's look at Joe, a theoretical new hire. Joe goes to work at age 25 for a starting salary of $40,000 at a company that makes widgets. The HR rep tells him about the company's 401k plan, and Joe thinks about it but decides he's too young to lock up his money so permanently. Joe's not dumb. He understands how retirement plans work and that there will be a 10% tax penalty if he withdraws any savings early. That worries him. What if he wants to buy a house or he meets the mate of his dreams and wants to finance a really great 
honeymoon in Cozumel. Plus, there's vesting to think about. His company uses graded vesting, so he won't be fully vested for five years, and he'll have to give up some of his employer's matching funds if he leaves before then. And that's a possibility. Joe is young and ambitious. He might trade up if he gets a better offer. No, there are just too many variables for his taste. He doesn't want to lock up his money in a 401k. Joe decides to save and to put his money in an index fund. But he does, he does so outside a retirement fund in a regular account where he can get at it without a tax penalty. However, this means he has to pay taxes as it earns money. He's only in the 25% tax bracket, so it doesn't matter all that much, but he does lose a small tax break. What happens next? Joe stays at his company for six years before changing jobs. During that time, he faithfully deposits 5% of his pay in his taxable index fund. Let's say, for ease of calculation, that amount is always $2,000 per year because in those six years, Joe doesn't get a raise. Joe is smart and ambitious, but the, wizard, the widget industry is stagnant. Widgets are used only by economists who use them to make metaphors. During that time, the market rises 5.1% annually, with Joe's index fund and its low fee structure giving him a 5% annual return. In six years, Joe's investment of $12,000 has grown to $16,574. Sounds good, right? However, Joe gave up his employer match. Had he used his company's 401k plan, he'd have more than $26,000, more than a third of it from his employer. Joe paid a high price to keep his money liquid. There are two important things we should note about Joe's situation. First, had Joe put his savings into a 401k account and amassed that $26,936, he would have wanted to be careful when changing jobs. If Joe simply cashed out, all that money would have become ordinary income, taxed at his usual rate. Moreover, there would be a 10% penalty for taking a withdrawal before retirement age. However, a direct rollover to an IRA or his new employer's 401k plan would spare Joe all that pain. A rollover, sometimes called a trustee to trustee transfer, is not considered a withdrawal and is not subject to a tax. However, you pay more fees and you lose a lot of fiduciary protection. So keep your 401k in a 401k. Do not roll it over into an IRA. The second point is that one reason Joe didn't want to put his money into a 401k is that he wanted it available for a home purchase. However, employers have a lot of discretion about allowing 401k withdrawals. The IRS allows a variety of tax penalty-free withdrawals from both IRAs and 401k accounts, including a $10,000 IRA withdrawal for first-time home buyers. There are restrictions, of course. If you take this option, you'll probably want to check in with a tax advisor to make sure you're playing safely by IRS rules. The point here, though, is that Joe worried unnecessarily about the lack of liquid in his 401k. Had he done his homework, he would have seen that there are ways around it. Do I like seeing people make use of these exceptions? No. In my opinion, retirement savings are retirement savings. They should not be available for any other purchase or purpose. But life is life. The point is, people shouldn't let liquidity worries keep them from saving inside their 401k accounts. Joe would have attained the tidy 
nearly $27,000 sum in a 401k account because of not one but several factors. Disciplined yearly contributions, the employer match, the tax break, and the low fees of an index fund. They all came together thanks to the power of compounding. Let's explore compounding a little further by examining what would have happened if Joe had made different decisions. First, Joe invests in a high-fee mutual fund. Second, because Joe believes the fund will beat the market, he halves his usual contribution of 5% of his salary to 2.5%, expecting that the return will be high enough to make up for his smaller contribution. Unfortunately, but surprisingly, the fund yields just 3.77% after fees and taxes. The consequences are dire. After six years, Joe has only $8,002. A third scenario might be that Joe had saved that same 2.5% inside his employer's 401k plan, getting the employer match and the tax break. In that case, he could have raised that amount to $12,320, even in the same high-fee fund. That's better, obviously, though still shy of the amounts he could have amassed by contributing 5% yearly to an index fund. Say it with me. Joe, save in a tax-free 401k. Get your employer match and don't pay high fees charged by actively managed funds. The key lesson here is this. It's easy to look at your annual salary and think of it as the main, perhaps the only factor in how much you can put away for retirement. But it isn't, and Joe proves it. For six years, he earns the same modest salary, but the amount of money he amasses for retirement is highly variable in our scenarios, from approximately $8,000 to almost $27,000. The range could be wider. What if Joe failed to contribute at all during his first two or three years? On the other hand, what if he decided to save 10% of his salary, even though his employer stopped matching at 6%? Between his savings rate and his choice of a fund to invest in, Joe has a lot of control over how much his retirement savings grow. So do you. It's true that some decisions are harder than others. Choosing to save 5% of your salary instead of 2.5% can be tough. As can choosing to lock up your money in a retirement account rather than keeping it accessible. However, picking an index fund instead of an actively managed fund is easy. Unless, of course, you're faced with this dilemma. Your employer's 401k plan doesn't offer index funds. Believe me, if this is the case where you work, you are not alone. Employers should be required by law to offer index funds in both major investment vehicles, stocks and bonds, but fewer than half do. You're not powerless though. Get together with your coworkers and ask your employer to do a house cleaning on the 401k choices by getting rid of the high fee junk and offering index funds. About allocation and rebalancing. If you've spent any time at all talking to people about investing, you've probably heard this rule of thumb. Your allocation in stocks should be 100 minus your age. In other words, if you're 40, then 60% of your money should be in the stock market, with the rest in bonds and other investments. Neat and intuitive, isn't it? also potentially quite wrong. There's no one-size-fits-all rule for allocation, and I'm not going to provide you with one either. 
What I can tell you is that your allocation should be between stocks and bonds, both in indexed funds, please. Yes, indexes aren't only for stocks. Bond index funds usually follow the Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Index. It has become the predominant benchmark for American bond investors and a benchmark index for many U.S. funds. Leave the exotic investments for the gamblers and the adrenaline junkies. Take a 50-50 allocation as your starting point and adjust it according to your age, marital status, estimated lifespan, and whether there are any factors in your life that may require you to need money sooner than you prefer. It's likely that unless you're quite close to retirement and financially comfortable, you want to adjust in favor of stocks toward a 60-40 or 70-30 balance. Stocks offer a better return over the long term, but bonds are lower risk, making them a less anxiety-inducing investment for people who are going to need their money sooner rather than later. Of course, if you're young and can ride out some fluctuations in the market, it's okay to start out with the 100% allocation in stocks. In fact, it's wise. They do tend to give you a better return provided you're in an index fund that tracks the market overall for a low cost. Which brings up this point. Your circumstances are going to change over time, which means you'll need to rebalance your portfolio from time to time. That means changing the proportion of risky and relatively safe vehicles. As you get older and retirement approaches, you should be shifting towards safer vehicles. Generally, that means more in bonds and less in stocks. However, in many years, the best thing to do will be nothing. Once you've set up a solid portfolio, according to my advice, or a fee-only advisor has set one up for you, it'll be good for a number of years. This is important, so I'm going to reiterate. Your annual portfolio review is about balancing risk and return, not about reacting to market fluctuations. Don't panic in down markets. Don't dump losers and chase winners. Even experienced investors make this mistake, but it is a mistake. And remember, if you're in index funds, as I've advised, you won't have a widely varied array of winners and losers in the first place. You'll just need to keep calm and wait for the market to rebound. A good fee-only advisor will know this as well, so if he or she doesn't suggest changes to your portfolio, don't make any. Finally, you'll need to do this only once a year. Honestly, an annual review is plenty. It'll keep you from being tempted to time the market. One of the first things I learned about my field is that economists never use the phrase timing the market. We know that it's a fool's dream. Part of the essential human need to know what's unknowable and control what's uncontrollable. I look over my investments every November. There's no profound reason behind my choice of month except that going over my finances just before the holidays keeps me from going overboard when buying gifts. Your home, investment, or liability. I've just said that your allocation should be split up between stock and bond funds, but I'm aware that for many Americans, there's another significant investment in the picture. Their home, whether your home should be considered an investment or merely a place to live is a debate that's heated up since the subprime mortgage disaster of the early 2000s. The causes of that debacle are beyond the scope of this book, 
but it's worth noting that America's fixation on home ownership predates the housing bubble of the 2000s. Since long before that, the real estate and lending lobbies have been telling Americans that home ownership is essential to happiness and prosperity, that a mortgage interest deduction is some kind of gift and a mortgage is legitimate debt. It's now virtually an article of faith that home ownership is the American dream. If you think that 300 million plus people all dream about the same thing, check your math. However, there are circumstances in which buying makes sense. Owner-occupied housing is often of better quality than rentals, for example. And in certain markets at certain times, housing can appreciate so quickly that it outpaces an owner's mortgage cost. These are situations in which it may make more sense to take out a mortgage than to keep renting. Because although buying with cash is the ideal, it isn't feasible for most people. A good rule of thumb is that your home's price should be about two and a half times your annual income. And saving up that amount is a daunting prospect. However, as I pointed out in chapter two, aging households tend to shrink as widowhood, divorce, and children leaving the nest reduce household size. In later years, you might find yourself with what I call too much house. In that case, it'll probably make sense to liquidate downsizing to a smaller house or even renting. The pro-home ownership arguments aren't as valid when you reach the downsizing stage. Here are a few things to consider when deciding if continuing to own a home is right for you. The tax advantage. Is it worth it? Americans worship at the altar of the almighty mortgage interest deduction, but it works out only for people who itemize, which, as I've already pointed out, most lower and middle income people don't do because for them, the standard deduction is worth more. Another way of saying this is that most lower and middle income folks pay less income tax if they take the standard deduction than if they itemize their deductions. Even if having mortgage interest does nudge you into the territory where it makes sense to itemize, Bear in mind that the mortgage interest deduction pays off most for the highest income taxpayer. Let's compare a middle class person with a federal tax rate of 28% and a high earner with the taxable income in excess of $400,000, whose tax rate is about 39%. The middle class person would save 28 cents in income tax for each dollar of home mortgage interest, whereas the taxpayer in the highest bracket pays 39 cents less per dollar. But either way, both of them are paying a dollar to the bank to get this deduction. The bottom line, the math never works in an interest payer's favor but the person with the highest income gets the most help from the government to buy a house and pay the bank interest. Are you really diversified? If nearly all of your net worth is tied up in your house, you're at risk. Your money would be safer in a broad portfolio of stocks and bonds. And that's a problem. It's hard to lose your entire investment in a house. As long as you need to live in your home, its value is mostly an abstraction. Of course, you can borrow against it, but that entails a whole new set of payments alongside your mortgage. With more interest, of course. Great for a lender, but not so good for you. How does rental housing stack up to real estate in your area? 
the quality of rental housing is good in some places, not so great in others. It may be worth it to buy it instead of rent if you'll get a better home for a comparable monthly expense. A final note about this, as I mentioned before, it often makes sense to sell your home if divorce, widowhood, or grown and flown children have reduced your household size, say from four people to one. Here's a good rule of thumb for whether you should sell your house. How much of your income is going toward your mortgage? If you can barely make the monthly payment, you have too much house. Liquidate, cash in on the equity you have and invest that money in an index fund. To see how housing decisions play out in real life, let's revisit two of our hypothetical people from chapter two, Jennifer and Paul. Jennifer is the 57-year-old real estate broker earning $125,000 a year. She has a $500,000. She has $500,000 from a divorce settlement and an inheritance, and she rents her apartment. The money is not in a 401k or IRA account. I commented that given Jennifer's goal to work through age 67, as well as her comfortable savings, she was on track for retirement on her terms. However, one dilemma that might arise from her is whether she wants to keep renting for the rest of her life or buy a home. My advice is that if Jennifer knows where she wants to settle down permanently, it's a good idea for her to buy a home, especially since as a broker, she's likely to be a very competent negotiator. But she shouldn't be confused by budget experts who advise not spending more than one quarter to one third of her monthly income on housing. And neither should you. Here, I have figured that Jennifer shouldn't pay more than $180,000 for a house, which will cost her about $10,000 a year in maintenance and taxes. <clears throat> that $10,000 is about 10% of her take-home pay, not one-third to one-quarter of her income. People with lower incomes spend a third of their income on housing, People who have more money and more costly things in their lives, like travel and expensive health care, spend a smaller portion of their income on housing. Also, that expert budget advice is not for young people who can expect higher incomes as they grow older. Jennifer is no spring chicken. Earnings fall for workers after age 50 especially for college-educated workers. Jennifer's basic expenses should be on the conservative side, so as she ages, she has room to pay for expected and unexpected costs of growing older. The bottom line, she should not buy a more expensive house that will eat up her capital, especially in taxes and maintenance. If Jennifer were trying to qualify for a 30-year home mortgage, the bank would say that based on her income of $125,000 per year and average interest rates and taxes, she could buy a home costing as much as $270,000. However, let's say she doesn't listen to me and buys a $212,000 home making a 20% down payment and taking out a loan of $169,600 with the 5% interest rate. Jennifer would pay more than $150,000 in interest on that home over 30 years. Granted, she'd recruit, recoup some of that from the mortgage interest deduction on her taxes, but remember my rule that there are two sides of the interest rate, earning and paying. Jennifer is much better off on the earning side. For that reason, she should pay cash for her home. A mortgage at her age is not a good bet. True, people often justify a mortgage because buying gets you better quality housing than renting. 
Since landlords generally don't maintain housing quality, but wanting better quality housing is an argument about consumption, not investment. Consume only what you can pay for. If you want better housing for the money, buy a less expensive house, one with a mortgage that you can pay off in two to seven years. Peg your housing budget to your annual income. That'll give you your target neighborhood and lifestyle. There is one argument for taking out a mortgage, though it's rarely valid in reality. If you buy when the housing market is heating up so that the value of your property appreciates at a greater rate than your mortgage interest rate, then it's a small win. The problem is no housing market will stay hot over the length of a typical mortgage. And there's always risk involved in buying housing. A market downturn could happen. Paying off the bank, however, is a sure thing. The bottom line. Jennifer should pay cash for the house, keeping the interest. She would have paid the bank for herself, and she should hold down yearly housing expenses to less than a quarter of her income. If she lives in a market with such high home prices that buying a $180,000 home for cash isn't a possibility, it's better for Jennifer to keep renting. Now we turn to Paul our widowed salesman. He's healthy, frugal, and a do-it-yourselfer type, but he's also amassed no savings. His chief asset, really his only one, is the house he inherited from his wife. So shouldn't he sell it? He could invest the proceeds, and isn't that a good thing given his precarious financial state? Actually, no. Paul needs a place to live, and remember, the house is paid off. That doesn't mean he lives absolutely free. There are property taxes and insurance to pay, but no rental on the market costs as little as those two monthly payments. So Paul should stay put. A better idea is for him to take in a renter, turning his house into a source of income and a way to pay for a new furnace and other maintenance costs. By now, we've covered several steps to taking control of your retirement plans. I've discussed how to put your best foot forward in the working world, how to spend responsibly and save more, and how to invest and allocate your funds. Many retirement books would stop here. But there's one more important step to go. And this step might pay off the most in ensuring a comfortable retirement for yourself and for others as well, such as your family and neighbors. Chapter 6, Voting and Civic Involvement, or We Can't Get Out of This Mess One by One. In the previous chapters, I focused almost exclusively on what you can do as a consumer, investor, saver, and worker to minimize the insecurity you may feel about your retirement. I laid out strategies that will allow you to grow old on your terms, but you need to use one more powerful tool, your role as a member of society who can vote and mobilize voters and residents to support the government programs that ensure a baseline of income and health care security. If you live to the age of 80, you'll spend as much time being a senior citizen as you did being a child. We need to spend time preparing for this last stage of life, or, as I like to say, our young selves need to take care of our older selves. A key part of that is understanding the roles the major government social insurance programs, Social Security and Medicare will play in your later years. Consider this. They are worth almost half a million dollars to a middle income American. According to economist Eugene Sturley 
and his colleagues at the Urban Institute, a single man who retires in the year 2020 after a full career earning a medium wage can expect to receive $536,000 in Social Security and Medicare benefits. For a married couple, also median earners retiring in 2020, the expected benefits are more than a million dollars. These are stunning numbers. It makes me proud that our country made a commitment during the depression to make sure that everyone would be protected as they aged. I think you'll agree that most of us wouldn't have the wherewithal to match these amounts. Even through a little more financial prudence, and picking the right investments. Despite this valuable insurance and despite the obvious good these programs do for Americans, they're underappreciated. Social Security in particular is chronically under attack by people who want to privatize it in the name of smaller government. Political elites use it as a bargaining chip in budget negotiations, calling for cuts. But here are the key realities of Social Security that everyone should know. Reality number one. Social Security is an essential form of insurance. It provides support for young families in the event of the death or disability of its breadwinners. It helps children with severe disabilities. It ensures workers against old age, disability, or dying and leaving behind a survivor without adequate income. As a retirement benefit, Social Security is worth about $300,000 for the average household. Equally important, its benefits are guaranteed. In contrast, 401k returns are very much not guaranteed. Reality number two, Social Security and Medicare benefits benefit all workers, whether white, pink, or blue collar. In 2012, 55 million Americans cashed Social Security checks. These were members of all segments of society, rich and poor, left and right. Economist Mosh Milevsky makes this clear in his excellent book, Your Money Milestones, A Guide to Making the Nine Most Important Financial Decisions of Your Life. He writes that all households, rich and poor, have the government as an economic partner. We all pay taxes and we all receive benefits from it. Through our votes, we exercise some control over how that money is spent. So no matter what your political leanings are or what your tax bracket is, the government is part of your financial life and always will be. This is equally true for the corporate CEO, the small business owner, and the starving artist. Reality number three. Social Security is on sound financial footing. In fact, It's a lean and efficient success. In 2015, its administrative expenses were less than 1%, falling from 2.2% in 1957. Compare that with the average 401k, which has expenses three times as high. Any clear-sighted look at Social Security's finances, free of politically motivated spend, shows that the program is in strong shape. It has a reserve fund to pay all benefits until 2031 without any change in current policy and with some small policy changes, for instance, raising the payroll tax by two percentage points or eliminating the earnings cap. We could put the system in balance for the next 75 years. We are easily poised to keep the system healthy well into the future. Privatizing Social Security by diverting some of the 12.4% payroll tax 
would cost the system more as money is diverted from the program. Also, the private accounts are more risky and cost more to manage. Simply put, privatization costs more to deliver less value, valuable benefits. There's no co institution or combination of institutions in the business world that could take in $600 billion a year and get it to America's seniors in the form of checks by the third Wednesday of the month, every month, as Social Security has done since 1940. In 2013, legislation was introduced to expand Social Security. I testified in the Senate subcommittee hearings. That was the first time advocates for the system had gone on the offensive since the 1970s. And it was a testament to Social Security's importance and strength. Although no legislation was passed at that time, you're going to keep hearing about this issue. Both parties understand that Social Security is foremost in voters' concerns. An expansion is within reach. Since far from being set in stone, the system is designed for continuous improvement there are always many ways to increase Social Security benefits and many easy ways to pay for an expansion. In early 2014, after a seminar in New Orleans, a financial planner told me that assuring Social Security's future is easy. We just have to eliminate the earnings cap like Medicare has done and the system will be funded indefinitely. We could also use the Consumer Price Index for the elderly, which is a more generous measure of inflation as it takes the rising cost of health care into account. I think I've made it clear that worry about Social Security's finances is completely unfounded. The program is perfectly instituted to solve a looming problem for the nation. In contrast, 401k plans are woefully underfunded. In 2010, 75% of workers nearing retirement had less than $30,000 in their 401k. 60% of low-income households are at risk of being unable to maintain their already modest standard of living in retirement. Individual savings don't look much better. About a third of households don't have any savings at all. More than 40% wouldn't have enough to cover basic expenses if they lost their main source of income. For this reason, many workers are tapping into their 401k plans early. In the years after the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009, Employees were taking out about 40 cents from their retirement accounts for every dollar going in. Their 401k plans and IRAs were being used as piggy banks to an alarming extent when these accounts had been created with the opposite vision. Instead of being withdrawn before retirement, their funds were supposed to be the foundation of a financially secure old age. With personal savings in such poor shape, Social Security has become the linchpin of many Americans' retirement. Today, Social Security provides 37% of income for the average American over 65 and about 80 to 90% of income for seniors in the bottom half of income distribution. <clears throat> Given the state of private pensions, this situation isn't likely to change anytime soon. In fact, it's more likely that the standard of living for seniors will fall and more middle class workers will be downwardly mobile, becoming poor and near poor retirees. The upshot, if there is a problem with Social Security, it's this, it's not generous enough to counteract the sorry state of retirement savings nationwide. The debate over Social Security is upside down. We need to make Social Security much more generous, and that's completely possible. 
we have the money to help everyone save for retirement. As long as we have an effective democracy, the public will resist cutting Social Security because the program works extraordinarily well. Social Security has been wildly successful at raising living standards for the elderly, even as other forms of retirement savings have grown shakier. Social Security is not a problem to be solved. It is the foundation of American retirement security, along with, of course, Medicare. The value of Medicare. Along with Social Security, the most successful social policy in America in the last 100 years has been Medicare. Americans from every walk of life, political persuasion and income level are enrolled in this program and use it to get health care. Together, these programs allow everyone, not just the rich, to live a normal human lifespan and have a period of rest and freedom at the end of their working lives. In old age, everyone has the same health insurance policy, finally. Medicare is the great leveler. A little more about Medicare. It's an astonishingly efficient way to provide health care. One criticism of the program is that it's too big and therefore inefficient. But in many ways, Medicare's size is its strength. For example, its scale allows it to analyze vast amounts of information to discern which medical practices are good ones and which are ineffective. Based on that research, Medicare can bring the best care to elderly patients. In the 1990s, Medicare funded mammography because mammography lowers breast cancer mortality rates. More recently, in 2006, Medicare acted to bring the best obesity surgery to all patients, regardless of which state they lived in. The second best use of Medicare's size and thus power is its ability to negotiate with the best healthcare providers and hospitals to give patients the lowest fees. There's one unfortunate exception to this. Congress has specifically legislated that Medicare cannot negotiate special deals with the pharmaceutical industry. So put this in your tickler file. The next time anyone tells you that Medicare is too expensive, politely agree and then recruit them to lobby Congress to give Medicare the ability to negotiate the cost of drugs. That would certainly lower the cost of Medicare. If you don't believe it, look at Canada. There, because of government negotiations, pharmaceutical cost, pharmaceuticals cost a fraction of what they cost in the United States. It's also crucial that we protect Medicare from another looming threat. The threat that Congress will reduce reimbursement rates to a point so low that physicians will leave the system and Medicare patients' choices will be restricted. We need to support far-sighted politicians who won't let this happen. Worried about cost? Medicare's administrative cost are a fraction of what private insurance companies spend. Consider, Medicare's overhead is less than 2%, and Medicare Advantage plans have an overhead of 14%. In contrast, the Affordable Care Act currently limits insurance overhead to 20%. How does Medicare keep costs down to less than 2%? It takes advantage of its national scope and overwhelming size. And most important, the government doesn't have to pay shareholders dividends from profit. Private health insurers enjoy higher profit rates than all other industries and their CEOs. According to Fortune magazine, five of the 10 highest paid CEOs in 2013 were in the health care industry. 
Only one in the top 10 was from Big Oil, the industry that many Americans would associate with rampant profiteering. But it's not just Social Security and Medicare that citizens need to get behind. It's Medicaid as well. Medicaid? Wait, that one really is for poor people, isn't it? No, in truth, Medicaid helps middle-income senior citizens as much as as or more than working-class seniors. The poor qualify off more often for Medicaid, but they receive only an average of $2,200 from it, whereas the middle-class elderly get an average of $3,300. The reason? Middle-income people live longer. A middle-class male in bad health at age 70 has about 7.1 years to live. A low-income man in good health can expect to live the same 7.1 years. Poverty undermines health. The middle-class income retiree lives longer, thus collecting benefits longer. Consider the case of Bill and Betty. This middle-class couple retired, outlived the lump sum from their IRA, and were getting along on Social Security. Bill had Alzheimer's, but Betty was able to look after him until she came home from the doctor one day with very bad news. She was in hospice and dead from lung cancer within 17 weeks. But before that happened, Betty and her family put Bill in a good nursing home, paying for one month with the remainder of what was in the couple's checking and savings accounts. After that, Medicaid took over. Medicaid and Social Security were invaluable to Bill and Betty. Some people would have have you believe that being middle income plus having a modicum of financial good sense is a fail-safe against financial hard times late in life. But that's not always true and for perfectly good reasons. As I've already pointed out, estimating your own life expectancy is difficult. So is speculating about the nature and length of illnesses that might befall you or your spouse. Social Security, Medicare, and yes, Medicaid are saviors for the many people for whom the do-it-yourself retirement planning model is not enough. A glimpse into the future. Congress has been slow to acknowledge that the do-it-yourself retirement system has been a disaster for the average American. But there are people taking up the cause, including me. My proposal is a supplement to Social Security called a Guaranteed Retirement Account. Noted in the New York Times as one of the most innovative economic ideas of 2008, the GRA, or Guaranteed Retirement Account, would be a national pension system that would remedy the failures of the 401k and the IRA model. In fact, for most people, it would replace the 401k and IRA and would help everyone accumulate a solid nest egg for retirement. This is how it would work. One, every employee would contribute 2.5% of pay via an automatic paycheck deduction in addition to Social Security contributions. And every employer would match the amount, raising the total contribution to 5% of annual pay before taxes. If you earn an annual salary of $50,000, you and your company would both put in $1,250 per year. As with the 401k, you could check your balance anytime you wished, watching the interest accrue. Number two, Congress would provide a refundable tax credit, meaning people who don't have to pay any taxes would still get a cash refund that went into their retirement account of $600 for every worker to offset their contribution on April 15th or before. 
I advocate a tax credit instead of a tax deduction because a deduction would favor top earners as it does under the current system. The tax breaks for retirement savings give more help to higher income taxpayers than those in the working and middle class. Famously, 2012 presidential election disclosures revealed that Mitt Romney had between $21 million and $102 million in a tax advantage Roth IRA. Giving tax breaks to a man of Romney's net worth just isn't a good use of taxpayer funds. President Obama in 2015 announced his intention to close this loophole. But the GRA's tax credit would give $600 to everyone, which especially lightens the burden on low-wage workers. In fact, it would entirely cover the contribution of someone making minimum wage. Number three, the Social Security Administration would collect the funds and then professional fiduciaries would invest the money in low-risk, low-fee funds. Number four, this plan would guarantee a 3% rate of return adjusted for inflation. Although this might sound low compared with the S&P's average annual performance in recent years, it is consistent with long-term economic growth. And remember, under my plan, this rate of return would be guaranteed even though during some years the S&P is certain to dip into negative territory. In years when the market is booming, the trustees could raise the rate of return or they could put the higher earnings into a rainy day fund. Number five, no one would be able to take withdrawals before retirement, except in case of permanent disability or death, in which case survivors would receive benefits. Number six, you can begin taking benefits at the minimum Social Security retirement age, although you can choose to keep working longer, thus increasing your balance and your eventual annuity. No one would be penalized for working later in life. In fact, the GRA would encourage work since delaying retirement would cause your balance to grow. Number seven, the GRA would pay benefits as an inflation-adjusted annuity, not a lump sum, eliminating the risk of outliving benefits. What inflation-adjusted means is that if inflation is running at 2%, the interest you earn would be 2% above that earnings. Your benefit would be based on your contributions and the investment income earned over your lifetime. Number eight. The GRA would provide some choices at payout, though most of the money would come as a monthly check as a pension does. You'd have the option to take a 10% lump sum withdrawal in exchange for a smaller annuity. That is, if you took the lump sum payment, your monthly benefit would decrease. Alternately, you could choose to get a smaller monthly check to leave a death benefit for a survivor. Under this plan, a full-time worker who retires at age 65 after working 40 years would get a benefit equal to approximately 30% of pre-retirement income. Since Social Security will provide roughly 40%, this person would retire on 70% of his pre-retirement income. The percentage I told you to keep in mind way back in chapter 2. I think you can see how a GRA incorporates the best aspects of both pensions and 401k plans and more to the point remedies the failings of 401k plans and IRAs. Under my plan, individuals couldn't forget or fail to put away money toward retirement nor could employees opt out of providing a match. High management fees couldn't erode savings because the money would go into a large pooled fund 
managed by a not-for-profit trustee trusteeship unsophisticated or overwhelmed individuals wouldn't put their money in the hands of guys who are largely salesmen paid on commission nor would they choose investments based on advertisements on late night television nor could they load up on company stock thereby failing to diversify their investments which can be a problem with 401k plans. They also couldn't break into their accounts to pay for non-retirement expenses. I laid out my idea for the guaranteed retirement account in an earlier book. When I'm 64, the plot against pensions and the plan to save them. Because of the shorter length and different focus of this book, I've given a shorter explanation here. But if you're interested enough, you can get more details in my other book. States lead the way. How far off is a guaranteed retirement account? A decade? More? Certainly, it'll be an uphill battle. The chief beneficiaries of the rise of the 401k and the IRA have been banks and brokers, and they would have a lot to lose from a changeover to a GRA plan. You can see how a switch to a national retirement plan would have the whole financial sector reaching for anti-assets. And I've said, and as I've said, they have armies of lobbyists with which to fight such a plan. But some states aren't waiting for change to come from the federal government. In 2012, California became the first state to pass a version of a guaranteed retirement plan called a Secure Choice Retirement Plan. The name doesn't matter. The basic idea does. Under the California plan, all private sector employers will be required to deduct a percentage of workers' income and put the money into a retirement account. The plan will also cover the few public employees who aren't covered at work. Professional fiduciaries, probably the same managers who invest money for CalPERS, the pension fund for state public employees, will manage the account. Unlike a guaranteed retirement plan, employees will be able to opt out of secure choice. But otherwise, the program works essentially like a pension and the quality of the money management will be vastly superior to the average 401k or IRA. The bottom line is that when Secure Choice is up and running, all working Californians will have access to a safe, secure investment vehicle for their retirement savings. Other states, Oregon, Maryland, Connecticut, Illinois, and Washington are considering similar plans. This is an encouraging sign. Though I advocate for a national plan, I've called for states to mandate employees to have an advanced funded retirement account if the federal government doesn't pass a GRA plan. But maybe, despite all of the advantages, you don't like the feel of guaranteed retirement accounts because it seems like forced savings. There would be no individual choice in investments, and you couldn't get at the money before retirement. In my plan, as in Social Security, no one can opt out. Or your objection could be simpler. You might be saying, why should I trust the government to manage my money? Believe me, there are arguments I've heard before as has anyone else who promotes a universal supplement to Social Security. Let me address the second one first. The government will not manage your money. In the GRA plan, the government collects the contributions and then chooses the best private money managers to invest them. An added benefit here is that because of the huge amount of money being invested, these professionals would have the clout to demand the best deals. 
and about a GRA plan being mandatory savings with no early withdrawals or individual control over investments? Consider this. We've already tried a system in which we choose whether and how much money to put in our retirement accounts, what to invest that money in, and whether to withdraw it early for needs other than retirement or disability. That national experiment is the 401k system, and I've clearly pointed out the results. Most workers have saved less than $30,000 toward retirement when what they need is close to $1 million. I'm not blaming the victim. It would have been hard to manage a personal pension account in the best economic times, and these have not been the best. My point is that most of us are simply not equipped to be pension fund managers for a pension plan of one. In a perfect world, we wouldn't need guaranteed retirement accounts because every employee would act like a human spreadsheet and contribute adequately to a 401k. Every employer would match funds and all the money would go into low risk, low fee investments. But we don't live in a spreadsheet world. It's hard to put money aside during hard times and harder yet to resist breaking into a nest egg during those hard times. Yet, we gladly pay for insurance of various kinds because we know we can't predict or control the misfortunes that might befall us. This is why Social Security is so popular. We like well-designed programs that help when needed in times of disability, retirement, or death. I propose the GRA as a supplement to Social Security's base a savings plan that is easy, secure, and pays out a steady, guaranteed stream of income during retirement. A change like this can start very simply and at a grassroots level. It has before. In 1933, two years before the President promoted and Congress enacted Social Security, an activist physician named Francis Townsend published a letter to the editor of the Long Beach Press-Telegram in Long Beach, California, calling for a simple taxpayer-funded plan to end misery among the elderly. Townsend's plan advocated for the government to pay $100 monthly for everyone over 65. This call to action to get money in the hands of seniors immediately triggered determine elders to form the Townsend Plan. The movement was so strong that within a few years, 20 states had enacted or threatened to enact old age security programs. The federal government stepped in to avoid a patchwork of mismatched state plans. The movement we need now is for the plan I called for in 2008 guaranteed retirement accounts. The GRA plan would have every worker or workers pay at least 5% into an individual account invested professionally in a fund, a national pension fund. The account would earn the highest risk adjusted returns at the lowest possible fees and be redeemed to supplement a social security retiree or survivor benefit. That would be that. I've showed that if every worker saved 17 to 20 percent of their paycheck, they would have enough retirement income after a lifetime of work. The GRA plan calls for a 5 percent contribution that would be added to the 12.8 percent FICA tax we pay for regular Social Security. We automatically save 17.8% of every paycheck, and we're set. An elegant solution to our upcoming retirement crisis. How do we get there from here? Let's pull out our pencils, pens, and iPads and start another movement like we did in 1933. Consider it a back-to-the-future movement. 
lest we go back to a future of 50% poverty rates among the elderly and old people forced to move in with their adult children or to poor houses before Social Security was instituted. How can you help? When I was 21 and working on my dissertation at UC Berkeley, I was asked to speak about changes to Social Security to an organization called the Grey Panthers and their radical cousin, the Older Women's League. But as it turned out, I probably learned as much from these dignified and confident women as they did from me. I'll never forget the lesson they taught me. Know the details of the government programs that you pay for. Know what is in your self-interest and teach others the importance of voting. They knew that a secure old age isn't just a matter of individual pennies in individual piggy banks. The big picture matters. It still does. Public policy has a direct effect on the quality of our lives. What Congress does or we, what we make Congress do will affect you in your old age. So stay informed. Understand what's being discussed and planned in Washington for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And keep voting. Politicians who understand the value of these government programs need your support, as do those lawmakers who see the need for a national pension system like the GRA. In fact, if you're so inspired, go beyond voting to political activism like the Grey Panthers and the OWL members who impressed me so much. Future Taxpayers will thank you. The good people serving the overcrowded homeless shelters will thank you for not adding to the line when you don't get in line, and your adult children will thank you. Most poignantly, your older self will thank you. So take care of that person. The end. I want to thank you, YouTube, for... Uh, going on this journey with me. Uh, this is the end of uh, the how to retire with enough money and how to know what is enough book by Teresa Ghilarducci. It was an excellent read, 116 pages, so it was very short. Hope you got a lot of value out of it. If you did, hit the like button, subscribe to my channel. I have other finance books, business books, books on entrepreneurship, uh, real estate, stocks and bonds. Uh, so, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'll have another book coming out soon. Stay tuned to my channel. And as always, until next time, get money, people.